Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to all of you joining us on this very, very important conversation from every part of the world. This is a conversation that really is focusing on the foundations of sustainability. And we're asking the question, how can global business use the 10 principles uh, to navigate recovery from the pandemic. My name is Nozi Shabalala down in Johannesburg at 9 a.m. and really uh, pleased to be the moderator of this conversation. Now, the context for the conversation is quite important. Let us recall that 20 years ago, the UN Global Compact was launched um, as a call to companies to align their strategies and their operations with the 10 universal principles that we know cover human rights, they cover labor, they cover the environment, and of course, they cover anti-corruption. And when we look at today, now more than ever before, we have to build on what we've achieved in the last 20 years in order for us to move with confidence towards Agenda 2030, to accelerate the, uh, our achievements towards the Sustainable Development Goals, and maybe in the more immediate environment, to ensure that we are recovering from this global pandemic. And of course, uh, we are recovering uh, better, we're recovering stronger, and we're recovering together. Now, before we launch into the conversation, it would be absolutely a miss of me not to uh, contextualize the fact that this conversation is happening at a very painful moment in race relations around the world. And so our panelists, who I will introduce very shortly, will also just take a moment to share a, a statement, a short remark on the racism and racial injustice that we are seeing around the world. Now, we have a stellar conversation coming up with a stellar panel. I'm inviting you in every corner of the globe to participate in this conversation by sending us your comments in the chat box. And I will do my absolute best uh, to bring your comments and your questions into the conversation. It gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Madame Michelle Bachelet, she is the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the United Nations. Madam, thank you very much uh, for making the time to join us. I'm pleased to thank introduce uh, Mr. Guy Ryder. He is the Director General at the International Labour Organization. Uh, Mr. Ryder, always uh, amazing to have conversations with you, especially in these times when the world of work is in such sharp focus. We're joined by Madam Inga Anderson. She is the Executive Director at uh, the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, Madam uh, Anderson, lovely to have you uh, join us as well. And in the nick of time, we're pleased uh, that we're joined by Madam uh, Gada Fatiwali, who is, of course, the Executive Director at UN Office on Dr Drugs and Crime. I'm going to launch into my first question, but with the understanding that our panelists might use the top end of their response just to share some of their thoughts on the racial injustice uh, that we're seeing in this moment. And I want to start by us maybe looking backwards first and to really reflect on the past 20 years and the extent to which the 10 principles have been a touchstone for business and the extent to which they have really been a guide in times of crisis. And so, Madame Bachelet, in your response, I'd really love for you to touch on the space of human rights in particular and the extent to which the 10 principles have been a touchstone in the last 20 years um, in, in elevating human rights within business. Well, thank you, Nosifo. Uh, yes, um, I think when we talk about human rights, this is often to describe how they have not been respected. But however, in the, in the business human rights field, the debate has evolved from arguing about um, the applicability of human rights standards to, to private sector actors, to dialogue about how, many, how business enterprises can translate their responsibility to respect human rights into concrete action. On the other hand, you see the growth of global compact from some 40 members uh, when it was launched in 2000 to over 9,000 business members today who are committed to the 10 principle. It's an illustration of how we think that uh, the pandemic poses an unprecedented, uh, I would say, um, threat 
to society, but also to companies. And so even the dramatic consequences of the crisis have exposed the weaknesses of, and, and, of political, economic, and, and social system. I've also exposed something that we all already knew, that it has not only exacerbated the inequalities that are in our society and in our, in our country. And then you see the effect, I mean, the virus does not discriminate, but affects is proportionally uh, a certain group of people. And I will link it to the issue you are mentioning about uh, uh, racial discrimination, racism, uh, and, and also other aspects of the scene, like xenophobia and so on. And this is something that we have spoken very uh, clearly since uh, after the death of George Floyd. And after we have seen also the impact of COVID-19 and minorities, Afro Afro-descendant in the U.S. and the U.K., but also in the U.S. Latinos and in the U.K. Um, Bangladeshis and Pakistanis. So we see inequalities in society that people are not willing to accept anymore. And they are testing because they feel that enough is enough. And we do believe that racial discrimination is something terrible. We have seen its consequences. Uh, but it looks like uh, it's like inequalities are there every day with expressions, but suddenly it looks like there, something terrible has to happen so people can be more aware and really stand up uh, against it. And tomorrow, in the in Human Rights Council, because we are in the 43rd session of the Human Rights Council, there will be an urgent debate on racism, and probably there will be a resolution to create a group of uh, people to, uh, um, like a commission of inquiry on racism in the U.S. and other member states as well. Madame Bachelet, thank you very much uh, for your response and, of course, speaking to the exposure of some of the weaknesses uh, that we've seen, an example being inequality, but also speaking to the concrete action um, that is going to be taken that could result in a commission of inquiry to really look into the issues around racism around the world. And this is an indication of action just going beyond dialogue and talk. I do want to come to you, uh, Mr. Guy Ryder. And the question, very similar to you, is to get your reflections on how you have seen the 10 principles of the global uh, compact impacting the way business has operated in the last 20 years. Thank you very much, Nocifo. Hello to everybody. You know, there is a, uh, a theme, a motto, um, written on the foundation stones of the ILO building. Um, it says, uh, if you want peace, cultivate social justice. It is a precursor, if you like, of the no justice, no peace placards that we are seeing in Minneapolis and Atlanta and in other parts of the world right now uh, in, in relation to uh, this current uh, uh, upsurge of revulsion against uh, racial discrimination uh, and, and violence. One of the four principles uh, of the labor, one of the four labor principles embodied in the global compact is the uh, principle of non-discrimination at work. Uh, we have a convention that was adopted in 1958 to outlaw discrimination on multiple grounds, including racial and ethnic grounds. It's been ratified by the vast majority of the ILO's member states. So the legal obligations have been taken on. And yet we know uh, that that's not how the world is. The world is not living up to those principles. And I think that a very strong message, and I welcome very strongly what Michel Bachelet has just said, that message is something we have to take with us across the board as we consider what we have achieved through the Global Compact and other instruments, and what remains to be achieved, because often the formalities do not match with the realities, and we have to dig down deeper uh, to the realities. Now, Sifa, you mentioned the importance of context. Can I just recall the context in which the Global Compact came into being, 2000? The world was having a major discussion, it seems like ancient history in some respects now, about how to organize a globalized economy. There was a big debate when the World Trade Organization was set up. Should we integrate human and labor rights and indeed environmental rights issues into the WTO treaty? The decision was no, we're not gonna do that. Uh, at the ILO that led to the adoption in 1998 of a, a major declaration on fundamental principles and rights at work. We took our responsibilities. And then Kofi Annan in 2000 followed up uh, with this attempt to involve the private sector uh, as well as public uh, public uh, authorities in the job of promoting these rights as the very definition, as the very guarantee of a sustainable globalization process. 
Now, I think the key thing of the Global Compact, to go directly to your question, was forming uh, this partnership between the public and private sectors, defining what it is we want to see from the private sector. And we can discuss how well we've done. I think that the Global Compact has served to render visible, to accelerate private sector engagement. We've seen a great growth of the Global Compact. But for the very reasons I mentioned at the beginning of my comments, uh, we shouldn't think that everything is perfect. This is not a job that's finished. It's not a journey that's ended. So we're still having to develop. And I think this 20th birthday of the compact, I'll close with this right now, is a great moment to say, well, this much we have done, this much remains to be done. And it's a complex and a vital conversation. Thank you. So lots of work remains to be done. Our sleeves need to remain rolled up. There's much to build on, but there's much still yet to do. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, and of course, for the, the context again of the moments in history that have led us to this moment. I wanna come uh, to you, um, Inga Anderson, and maybe elevate the reality that today we are seeing a range of interconnected unprecedented environmental challenges coming uh, to the fore. And the question to you is along the same vein, to what extent have uh, the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact uh, galvanized business to step up in their environmental responsibilities? Thank you. I think we can certainly say that there has been a shift but in first reflecting on racism and on Black Lives Matter, let me just say that in UNEP, in the United Nations Environment Program, we are part of two UN agencies that have the privilege of being based in the Global South. Our headquarters is in Nairobi. And so when we are seeing on the TV screens what we see, this hits particularly home with all of us. And seeing uh, this level of discrimination is obviously abhorrent and completely unacceptable. We work on biodiversity, and so we understand the diversity of life, diversity in nature, as well as diversity in human humans, diversity is a wealth. And so when we had a town hall and discussed Black, Life, Black Lives Matter amongst ourselves with our global footprint of 45 country offices, this was something that uh, people uh, could uh, obviously understand also because environmental crisis and environmental pollution often hits those who live uh, and are discriminated against. They live downwind from the fumes, they live where the water is dirty, they suffer from toxic uh, environments often, whereas wealthier people may be not discriminated against in society, often live in green and lush. So environment discrimination are very well connected, unfortunately. Um, so this is something that we recognize. Now on your question, I, I would say just like Guy and Michelle, that was obviously we've seen some fantastic step forward with the Global Compact. There are three principles in, amongst the 10 that deal with environmental issues. The precautionary approach, I, if you, it's like buying an insurance policy. If you don't know, don't go there until you understand because this could have very negative impacts, right? The second one, you have a responsibility to do good, to do environmental stewardship. And third, make sure that in your, and uh, the, the principle uh, nine, make sure that in your investments, you diffuse environmentally positive technologies and you invest in R&D and such. Now, a lot has been done, and I would say that the global, platform, uh, the global compact has been a platform really for enabling a deeper understanding of these three planetary crises that we are facing. The cl climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the nature crisis, if you like, and the chemical waste pollution toxicity crisis. And these three, and I would say that in the business community, we see a standing up and an awareness. But like Guy said, we're not there yet. We have a long way to go. The pandemic has taught us that we are totally unprepared for risk. And sad but true, um, COVID-19 is but a small overture to what climate change will bring, to what biodiversity loss will bring. Uh, so I'll stop there, but we'll get into that, I'm sure, in our conversation. But just to say that 
This has been a fantastic step forward for the UN as a platform. I had the honor of serving on the board of the Global Compact for four and a half years. So I've been around this for quite some time. Um, and so I'm very familiar with it and I can see what a positive force for good it has been. But we've got further to judge. Thank you. Yeah. Inga, thank you very much for this. And I, I suspect uh, as we uh, look back on these 20 years, you're also assessing uh, the impact of your journey. But thank you for reminding us of the importance of moving from passive awareness to active awareness. Because if we are still sitting in the precautionary space, if we are still sitting just in the responsibility space, we're probably as business not doing as much as we can. And of course, reinforcing this idea that we're absolutely unprepared for the risk uh, that could come be coming our way. And that is a big uh, caution that we have to be paying attention to. I want to come um, uh, back to Madame Gada um, Wali here and pose the same question, but slightly differently, Madame, because to say, if we think about it, drugs and crime are often spillovers uh, from corruption and poor governance. In your, in your view, what has been the impact uh, of the 10 principles, in particular uh, in the fight against corruption and in support of good governance. Thank you very much uh, and I'm happy to join you today. Um, it's a very important question because the private sector has been at the epicenter of the pandemic. And uh, definitely uh, the, the fact that uh, the, it's not going to be business as usual. It's not, they're not going to be back to ways of doing business. We will see many, many changes. Uh, drugs and crimes, uh, uh, but, but also corruption, uh, have been uh, the, the, the corruption has been the, the principle number 10, which we have been, uh, which the global compact has been focusing on. And uh, the element of corruption is very important when you speak about doing business and the private sector. The private sector has a great role to play and will have a, a greater role to play even uh, post pandemic. They cannot go back to uh, doing business as usual. Uh, it is not going to be about just shared profits. It has to be about shared values. And uh, the idea of transparency, accountability, good governance are going to be very central for private sector to survive, to grow, and to strive. Uh, it is expected that business will change, doing business will change, uh, and there will be a greater impact, we hope, on solidarity, solidarity between business owners and workers, solidarity between different businesses, solidarity between businesses and society. And all these elements together uh, will help us uh, um, globally get out of, of this pandemic. So... Um, the 10 principles have been important. Principle 10 has been quite important because of the focus on corruption, which is an important element. And uh, compounded with what happened in the pandemic, it becomes even uh, of greater importance to make sure that as we rebuild, as we get out of this pandemic, we build back better. We build back in a more transparent, accountable, and we, we make sure that there's no space for corruption. Mm, thank you very much. So really succinct and to the point and really zooming in on corruption. Now, I've made a promise uh, to our global audience that where possible, I'm going to bring in uh, some of their questions. So I'm going to steal this opportunity to come to you, a guy, with a very, very quick uh, response. The question is straightforward. Human rights and labor are the least respected principles by business. How are we ever going to change this behavior? A quick thought from you. Yeah, I mean, you'd expect the ILO to want to put the, the spotlight on the labour principles, and, uh, and your question enables me uh, to do that. Yeah, uh, it does sometimes seem to be the laggard in the pack, doesn't it? Uh, and this is, I think, because it is sometimes difficult for people to realise that if workers cannot organise, if they cannot bargain collectively, you're going to get some very, very unpleasant and unfortunate outcomes, particularly, and it's already been mentioned, in respect of inequality. I mean, there is a massive correlation between collective bargaining protection, more equal outcomes at work than in society. So I really think, you ask how we're going to move forward, and it's a question I think that applies across the board in the Global Compact. What I would like to put the emphasis on, to be very quick, is this combination of public policy and private initiative. You know, to get the right outcomes, the outcome that the Global Compact is, is, exists to promote, 
It isn't just a matter. It isn't just a matter of voluntaristic behavior in the private sector. This has to be framed uh, through public policy and, and public priorities. I'll give the example, which doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Inga. You know, what would businesses be in terms of their environmental objectives if we didn't have Paris and the climate change uh, agreement from Paris? We need this framing, this public policy framing of what we expect uh, from business and then locate business initiatives in that space. Public policy framing uh, cup, coupled with private initiative. And as you were speaking, uh, Inga was nodding her head uh, on that point, uh, Guy. So I, uh, the, she is taking claim uh, of, 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 of that uh, thought and that idea. But Madame Bachelet, let me come back to you because the reality is, if we come to the present moment, the reality is there's a lot of pressure that is being put on businesses of all sizes across all industries. And many businesses are just fighting to survive right now. And the effect of this is that we're seeing sustainability almost fall off completely in terms of falling off the agenda. The question to you is, how do we ensure that business keeps a firm focus on upholding human rights and that they remain anchored in ethical decision making, even at a time when it appears as if there's really short term survivalist decision making as the norm? I understand. I think it's a very challenging time and probably for some the temptation would be to forget about the 10 principles and just to use the ones that, that could be more interesting. But the truth is that, uh, uh, that you can do it anyway using the, 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 uh, ten, the two, I mean, the 10 principles, but also the two global compact principles are equivalent to the UN guiding principles for business and, and human rights. And, this is the global standard applicable to all enterprises. And we believe that even though businesses are facing complex challenges, the principles and values provide, I would say, essential guidance on how to navigate huh, such challenges in this uncertain time. For example, uh, the question of what is expected when a company has to downsize its workforce. While businesses are strongly uh, encouraged to evaluate all possible alternatives to disengagement, a company may have to downsize its workforce, especially when facing a drastic collapse of its uh, revenue stream. So what matters is that the measures a company takes in response to the crisis should be subject to careful assessment on the human rights impact and of what measures can be taken to mitigate such impact, for example, when layoffs are necessary in the face of dramatically reduced revenue. Because on the other hand, there are many enormous benefits to both companies and investors to adopt a principle-based approach in building long-term value, the support of virgin and uh, ESG investors, uh, attracting talent, and avoiding the rise in regulatory and legal risk as many governments move to increase some greater business transparency and due diligence. I think it's difficult, but it's also, as it has been mentioned by Guy and by Inge, this is also linked not only what the private sector does, but also what the public sector does I mean, in responding to this crisis. I was in charge of the government in the 2008 crisis, and we supported the SMEs and supported because sometimes big companies can um, can support better, I mean, can uh, have better performance or they can survive, but a small no. And on the other hand, you can support when there's need of it, you can have a, a sort of a um, a basic income, emergency income, to support the workers that are jobless or the poorest family. So there's a lot of things on social protection schemes that can be provided so that company and, and, and also fiscal uh, stimulus package that can be helpful for companies, but also for the people who have lived the impact of the need to downsize and help on their jobs. Absolutely. So very clear directive that it has to be long-term uh, thinking. It has to be long-term decisions that are really rooted in sustainability. So Inga, this throws the question, the next question, clearly uh, back to you because we have seen an evolution of corporate responsibility and sustainability moving from a voluntary action and embedding itself in compliance or um, as a compliance, uh, requiring compliance within business. Question to you, how do we, one, balance this short-termism with an approach to sustainability and how do we ensure that sustainability remains a strategic focus for businesses around the world? 
You know, the days where you could pollute yourself to waste, to, to wealth are just long gone. You can't extract, emit, pollute, toxify and get wealthy and think that that will be sustainable. Maybe you could argue, I would argue you cannot, that when you are just a billion or two people, you could get away with it because we weren't seeing each other's ways. But we live in this super interconnected world. And you look at what COVID is and did. Within a, the blink of an eye, it was global. And friends, it's the same with climate change. It's the same with pollution. And it is the same with biological diversity loss. Nature, biodiversity, gives us the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the houses we build. You can't continue pushing nature into a corner and expect that it will give us the weather regulating uh, function and all the other things that I just mentioned uh, without it. So with, without having nature being in balance. And so I think what we're learning here is that, um, yes, you need regulations, but what's really super interesting is that when you have, there was a recent poll done, an Ipsos poll done uh, uh, on Earth Day, it found that 71% of adults globally agreed with climate action as being part of the stimulus package. Now, that's, that's really interesting because it shows that people get that it is not environment or economy. It is environment is economy and economy is environment. And sound job growth is what we need to aim at. So when Rada says build back better, we mean build back sustainably with rights, labor, human, uh, anti-corruption, but also green. And we are now seeing these massive stimulus packages as we should. The first wave of these packages are fiscal in nature. So that means, um, as Michelle was saying, money is in people's pockets very fast, just get the cash out. You can't green that, but, but it's super needed. But the next wave will have infrastructure dimensions or it will have other dimensions that will involve something uh, in the productive sector one way or the other. And here you really can. And we're already beginning to see that. France, for example, has said um, they will bail out uh, Air France, but not only if they discontinue airlines, uh, air, air journeys, there are less than, I think, two, two and a half hours or so, where you can just take the train and get done with it. Um, UK are discussing right now in Parliament a jobs package that will focus on green jobs. Pakistan has uh, rolled out a jobs package doing what? Planting trees. So, um, and, and this is really good in a highly dry country. So there are ways that you can encourage that. So on the one hand, people are asking for it. On the other hand, forward-looking governments across the spectrum of, of developed developing are seeing it is possible. And in work that we did with ILO, as a matter of fact, we showed that the green jobs opportunity is massive. 24 million jobs could potentially be provided by investing in greening infrastructure, greening public uh, transport, uh, and, 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 and greening our cities, which will be good for us and for our world and for the future. And between the large and small business uh, uh, dimension that Michelle mentioned, it is at times considered harder for smaller businesses to do this, but uh, that's where these alliances between businesses can be very important uh, to enable that. So you need the regulatory framework, you need an informed public that demanded, and you need inspirational businesses that will that will deliver it, um, and I think, in spite of it all, that that's what we're beginning to see in a good number of countries. So I'll stop here. Thank you. So, so, so some fantastic uh, inputs uh, there, Inga, right from the beginning that you actually cannot pollute yourself to wealth. I'm sure that a lot of uh, a lot of our viewers are going to be tweeting that uh, that uh, that phrase that you've shared. But more importantly, the environment and the economy are the same size of the same coin and not mutually exclusive of each other. And there is an idea here that you've surfaced, this idea that we need to be strengthening the alliances between small and medium-sized enterprises and big business if we are actually going to see sustained change. Now, um, Madame Wally, let me come to you before I, I circle back to some of the opportunities that the crisis could be throwing our way. And I want to, I, I want to make this um, hypothesis that a drug-free and a crime-free world 
starts on the basis of a commitment not only to ethics within a society, but ethics within business as well. My question to you is, at a time when companies are putting all their energy on surviving, um, how do we ensure that we don't lose sight um, of ethical uh, business and we maintain our focus on the 10 principles? Well, I think that one of the successes of the global compact over the last 20 years is that they made the business case for sustainability, that many companies, uh, many societies, many governments realize that sustainability and being good is good for business. It's not about being good because you're good, you're good but it's, it's good for business. Ethical companies do attract talent and retain motivated workers. They, they, it strengthens their brands. You see uh, many campaigns in many countries where uh, people call for boycotting this uh, company or that company because of the practices of that company. We have seen CEOs step down because of practices that have been attacked on the social media. So there is the social media world that is very, uh, um, that uh, scrutinizes businesses. There is a more informed public than ever before that really cares about the practices of the companies and the values that the companies share. And there is a recognition from governments that private private sector is a crucial partner and player in the fight against crime and against corruption and against all uh, that is hurting uh, globally. So consumers uh, still care about sustainability, I believe. Consumers will be the driving force and they will be the pressure uh, that will put the companies back to track if some of them uh, would drop off the sustainability of their agenda, as you have mentioned. Um, COVID has exposed the fragility of the systems and the fragility of the, uh, the societies and the infrastructure, not just in health, but in many other sectors. So I think this fragility will even uh, enforce the idea of sustainability, that we need sustainability, we need to think sustainably, we need to act sustainably, we need to be aware of our environment. And the fact that this minuscule uh, virus has been uh, hitting the whole world is something that is related to uh, the relationship with wildlife, the relationship uh, with nature. Uh, the fact that the virus came possibly from animals to humans is something that makes us really question and be more aware and has, has made many, many more people uh, more aware of the practices uh, of, of humans uh, and how we are treating uh, uh, we are treating nature, but also how the companies are uh, practicing uh, sustainability or not. Uh, and integrity uh, is, is becoming a, a very important element. And you see that many governments have in place um, legislation that are giving companies, be it with lower carbon emissions or with solid human rights or with a better labor track records, favorable consideration. So it's not just that governments are... are, are um, paying more attention to sustainability, but people and the public, the consumers are paying more attention to sustainability. Thank you very much, Madam Wally. And I, I mean, I want to lift this because these words uh, have really resonated with me. You've said COVID has exposed our fragility. And in the context of I know we've had a large focus on sustainability, but we've also touched on ethics in this part of the conversation. And the question that's playing back to me is, could it be that COVID has also exposed our fragility in ethics? It's exposed our fragility in integrity and potentially has exposed our fragility in humanity, especially when we begin to think about some of the continued practices that we still have to have our sleeves rolled up for that are happening along supply chains and are still a lived reality of many workers around the world. I do want to change track though. I do want to bring some positivity into the conversation and I do want us to talk a little bit about opportunity. We know that um, the current crisis is uh, really forcing us to rethink business models. It's forcing us to rethink the, the decisions that uh, would otherwise govern how we run our businesses. And it's creating an opportunity for us to create a better and more sustainable economy. I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, Guy, I'm going to come to you first. And I'm going to ask you to please share with me one example 
of a crisis that has emerged in the space of the world of work as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic that you believe can be reframed into opportunity. And if we do reframe it, um, we will move towards recovering better, recovering stronger and recovering together. Thanks. I think it's absolutely right that in these really horrendous circumstances, we do try to look for opportunity uh, moving forward. So I'm going to pick up on what's been said about fragility and precarity uh, in the world of work and in our societies. One of the most dramatic things we have seen over the last month or so is what's happened to workers in the informal economy. And it's easily forgotten that more than six out of 10 workers in the world make a living in total informality. No labor law applies, no social protection, nothing. And just imagine what's happened. You know what's happened to these people. Uh, of these two billion workers, 1.6 billion now face massive disruption to their livelihoods. Basically, if they're in lockdown, you know, if they don't work one day, there's no money, there's no food on the table. So where is the opportunity in this disaster? It's uh, the opportunity is to start to take seriously uh, the need to get at least minimal social protection to these people, to protect them against the vagaries of, uh, of our existence. Um, it's been said by other colleagues that we were massively underprepared, no resilience in the social sphere in this regard. Let's now pick up in the many uh, parts of building back better that we now have to address on building social protection systems around the world. Does it sound impossible? Does it sound too expensive? It's an investment, and it's an investment that we cannot afford not to make. Uh, and if I can just take 20 more seconds, Nasipo, you know, at, at this time, what are we seeing at this moment? Quite rightly, we are seeing governments expend large amounts of money on fiscal and monetary stimulus, on helping enterprises and helping them to retain uh, their workers, helping them to survive this pandemic. We don't want to see viable enterprises become victims of this pandemic. But this raises, I think, an entirely legitimate public policy discussion about what the counterpart of that uh, access to the public purse means for the future behaviour of, of businesses. Now, we're all aware of these controversies. You know, should uh, companies which take advantage of furlough programmes, uh, public support, be paying out dividends this year? What should we say about executive pay? There is, I think... Um, a positioning of the debate today, and I don't want to go into the polemics out there, which says that companies do have to be a part of and a willing partner of the Build Back Better process. And again, I repeat what I said earlier on. This is where public and private actors do need to come together and get the job done. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you, guys. So a very clear call to action. You're shining the spotlight on the informal workers, two billion of them in a population, and to say, well, here's an opportunity for us to push on social protection. This is a way we can reframe the crisis. But you're also saying a very clear call to action to business that we need public and private practice to converge in a meaningful way if we are going to do, um, if we are going to be building together stronger and recovering better. And of course, it raises the question, what do we need to do differently in the way that uh, public and private partnerships have existed before? Madame Bachelet, this, I believe, might be a really difficult question, but again, the same question to you. Can you share with us one example that you are seeing uh, as uh, something that has been a result of the crisis in the human rights space, but that we could reframe into an opportunity? Anything that you would like to share? Well, uh, first of all, I hope so. Uh, that, is, uh, the, that this can be a very important opportunity to build uh, back better, uh, because I think, uh, as um, Guy and he has mentioned, there's no option. We cannot, we don't have option because the world, like if you think before the pandemic, in the world there was lots of people protesting on the streets because really they feel that their lives are not, uh, that they don't have the welfare basic needs they need. And, and so people are not happy with the, with the existing economy, with a non-sustainable economy, with an economy that's not inclusive. So we need to build back better in a, a new economy that is inclusive and is, is greener, if I may say. But just before the pandemic hit, there was already a growing movement away 
from the idea that business should uh, focus on maximum, maximizing shareholder returns, calling for business to respond to the interests of stakeholders beyond uh, uh, shareholders alone. And, and I think uh, this is a positive development. And we have seen that, that it, it can be very positive if business needs to look beyond the generic categories of stakeholders like uh, employees, suppliers, customers, communities, to give, cons to give adequate consideration to those who are most vulnerable, especially in the uh, companies' global, global supply chains and platforms workers. And they often constitute the most vulnerable the women and, and migrants. And Guy was talking about the informal economy, and uh, women are the majority of the informal workers in, in many parts of the world. So this is affecting disproportionately women as well. So, but, but on the other hand, you see, you, you can see some companies who are doing the right thing, who are trying to solve the problems in a different way. You see companies that, for example, I think it's HIM, who did not cut the, the um, how do you call that, when they already have a, asked for some production and they maintained and they bought the production even though they were closed. So there are companies that have been doing good things. That's only one example, there's many other examples. But, it's, but, but, but again, I do believe that we cannot continue doing business as usual. Our, our norm is not to go back to normality as the day before the COVID-19 started. We need to build much, much better because, and we all know, and it has been said by Inge and by Gada, that this, uh, I mean, the virus will continue there. If we don't respect nature, if we don't respect biodiversity, we have had, uh, I'm a medical doctor, that's why I'm always trying to look at these things as well, Ebola, MERS, uh, SARS, and now COVID-19, and probably much more. So if we are not really convinced that we need to change the economy and, and how it takes more a consideration of stakeholders and not only shareholders, but also how it needs to be sustainable. It needs to be greener. And it can be the green economy, but also there's another fantastic possibility on the blue economy as well. And, and there are very important possibilities there. So, uh, because usually we talk about nature, we don't talk much about ocean, but ocean are playing a very substantive role in this as well. Madame Bachelet, uh, thank you very much uh, for that contribution. And again, a very clear reminder that we had, we had started to make progress in the conversation about talking about um, shareholders, rather, I'm talking about st broad stakeholders rather than just the narrow shareholders that are invested in a business. And the value of what you're sharing with us is that you've lifted some of these examples to say, let's not forget women, let's not forget the platform. Uh, platform workers. Let's not forget the migrants. And if we are going to be building back better, we have to do it without leaving anyone uh, behind. Thank you again for reinforcing the opportunities that are sitting in the blue and the green economy that really are rich and ripe with opportunity now if we are uh, invested in them and we're focused on that opportunity. Inga, I'm going to come to you last because I've got a question from our global audience uh, that is for you as well. So let me come to Madame Wali. Uh, with this, with the next question, and which is the same thread, uh, Madame, which is really, can you give us an example um, of a crisis that has emerged in the uh, in the space of fighting against drugs and crime that you think could be reframed um, as an opportunity and make for a far more effective uh, fight um, against drugs and crime? Madam Wally, just to check in that you are not muted. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that in every crisis there is an opportunity. In each and every crisis, opportunity, because with crises, you there is a new realization of how you can work with others. There is a reshaping and an opportunity to reshape partnerships. So uh, in, in every crisis, we see a new partnership, new types of partnerships emerging. The public and private uh, partnerships will develop due to this crisis. The work that we do, for instance, in trafficking uh, in persons is very important, where we have been uh, assisting uh, in, uh, in applying and in developing
ensuring sustainable procurement policies and procedures. With the stimulus packages, for instance, we have been seeing a lot and large amounts of money going from government to help uh, uh, societies. With be these big stimulus packages, there is a big threat of corruption, a cor corruption in procurement, corruption due to the speed of wanting to deliver, of mistargeting and not reaching the right target. So putting in place the policies and the measures and the procedures that should be followed is something that we are very interested in. Also, uh, to, it is an opportunity for the global compact itself to jumpstart and scale up the progress they have uh, uh, succeeded in making in the last 20 years in looking at the partnerships between the large companies and the small companies where we see a, a, a change in the value chain. So you could see that the relationship in the same country, because many, many companies, companies stopped working because of inputs coming from uh, countries that have locked down, uh, small inputs and parts coming from China, for instance. So uh, I think it is time to consider looking inwards, looking at the small producers, looking at a better and more integrated value chain. So this is another uh, opportunity for companies and private sector to look uh, for uh, the forging new partnerships and new relationships with the smaller companies. Uh, a good opportunity, for instance, the work that we do with the World Bank on the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative where it has become more important than ever to recover and return the stolen proceeds of corruption uh, um, and, and work between private sector and government to really help uh, countries uh, recover the stolen proceeds of corruption and, and bring back uh, through the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative uh, and the work with the International Bar Association and partner, Partners Against Corruption uh, and the World Economic Forum, different groups that we work with to really uh, work on this uh, stolen asset recovery problem. So tackling problems vis uh, using new partnerships between the um, private sector, the public sector, but also civil society and academia and science society. I think this, uh, this crisis uh, is a good opportunity to rethink our partnerships, be it external partnerships between countries or even within the country between big businesses and small businesses. Fantastic. So a beautiful focus on reviewing not only the partnerships, but who the traditional partners are. And what I'm hearing you saying is that we need to be bringing in and creating the space for academia. We need to be creating the space for civil society in these partnerships. And that's how we get the best uh, uh, partnerships that could come out. So there's a beautiful thread in this conversation, which is really the review of how we work better together. And so, Inga, let me come to you next with the, the next question. The question is exactly the same for you. Um, the crisis that you're seeing in the environmental space, but more importantly, if reframed, how can this be translated into an opportunity? I do want to put to you the question that's come from the global audience as well. And this comes from a voice that says, what if businesses' idea of building back better is not good for the environment? How can we be certain that environment will be more important than profit? I think it's a fantastic question and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, maybe I'll start with the last one and then I'll get to the first one. Um, look, uh, as consumers, we have the power. And so, at least a good part of the power, we purchase, uh, we discuss, we take environment where we want it. We can take it over the dinner table. We can take it into the classrooms. We can take it into the workplace, we take it into the supermarket, and we take it into the voting booth. Each of these places are places where we as citizens should take sustainability. And in so doing, we begin to impact because people actually listen uh, to those uh, that, uh, that make those noises. Uh, at times, we've taken it to the streets. And each of these are part of expressing this. Now, so that's one part. Um, at the same time, we need a good regulatory setting and uh, a non-corrupt law enforcement of those regulatory settings. We need a free media that will enable uh, that uh, whistleblowers on environmental dimensions will be able to say so. And we need to protect environmental defenders who, unfortunately, in some countries are being harassed and murdered. So, um, so you know, there's a lot to do. 
but I think there is a clarity. We need to not just abscond from our individual responsibility that we have. And, you know, do you know, do I know when I pick up a piece of something in the supermarket that it's deforestation free? That's a regulatory dimension. Now, some, some uh, uh, manufacturers are beginning to put that on it, but we need to think about regulatory dimensions in this regard. That's only the first question. Second question. So many things, I mean, this is obviously a horrendous crisis and we should uh, be very clear on that, but we must look for how we can move forward and pivot into a positive next step. And there are two things, well, there are many things, but I want to mention just two things. And one is a very nice bridge from what Michelle was saying. Uh, she's a medical doctor, so she can say these things with a degree of confidence. Uh, but um, these, this disease, uh, COVID-19, it is a zoonotic disease, Z Z O O notic. so zoological, from the zoological, from a biological, from the animal world. And we need to understand that zoonosis, zoonotic diseases, have been around for a long time. They, they migrate from the animal world into the human world. What we are, however, seeing is that 60% of known uh, infectious diseases are zoonosis and 75% of new infectious diseases are zoonotic in nature. And so we have to ask what is happening here because we are also seeing an intensity and frequency of broader outbreaks of epidemics, not necessarily pandemics, happening. And that is, of course, because of our pushing nature into all these corners and of fragmenting and illegally trading, Rada referred to that, uh, and of unsanitary conditions. Often the zoonosis exists in the animal worlds, but through an intermediary species, a bat, a rat, what have you, they can be transmitted into our world. So therefore, this year was and is still the super year for nature. And this is the year when we are supposed to get a new deal for nature, our COP21 for biodiversity. Now, that COP, it's actually COP15, but people recognize COP21, therefore I said that. Um, so, so that should have happened in November in China because of the situation. It has been postponed till next year. But people need to demand and now, in view of what we understand by zoonosis, get that ambitious deal that could be the same level of ambition as what we agreed. Secondly, and I have to say this, we have three conventions, uh, the Basel, Rotterdam and, um, and Stockholm conventions that deals with waste and chemical, chemical and waste. And what, and these, these, what we've seen under the Basel convention is, uh, what we've seen, sorry, is in terms of illegal export of trash, especially plastics. Um, been a significant problem. Poorer countries receiving this garbage on their shores where wealthier countries could frankly dump it. And the poorer countries not having the ability to dispose of it. So here, I'm very proud that the Basel Convention, which is a UNEP uh, hosted convention, has come up with a new annex that regulates this. We are seeing massive amount of plastic waste because of COVID and we're seeing hazardous and waste, uh, medical waste, and we do not necessarily have the incineration. So we need to step into that space, get our act in order on how we manage waste nationally and not export it and dump it elsewhere. These are key issues that we take away from this. Thank you. Inga, thank you for your energy um, and in that response and that reminder that this is still the super year for nature and for shining the spotlight on that, but also um, the, the Basel Convention and the progress that's been made in that regard. I've got almost five minutes left and I really want to uh, get one more question uh, round Robin in the conversation very quickly. But uh, I'm going to come to you, Guy. But your question is going to be slightly different because I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, converge it with a question that's come from the global audience. The question, what I want us to focus on now, is how do we accelerate? How do we scale up? How do we ensure that there is a greater adoption and a translation of the 10 principles as we look forward towards Agenda 2030 uh, and beyond? Guy, as you respond to that, may you also touch on a question that says um, SMEs are reluctant to adopt the SDGs because they do not see the return on investment. How do we convince them otherwise? Um, a quick minute from you and I'll, I'll round Robin uh, across the panel. 
Okay, very telegraphically. Uh, on, on the first issue, uh, how do we scale up and speed up, I think, is the question. And the answer is, uh, at the international level at least, uh, we have the agenda. We have the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. We're supposed to be entering into that uh, decade of action to get there. We started the decade well behind. Let's be honest, we weren't on track. We have to lever this terrible crisis into this opportunity in the way that everybody has talked about. Uh, and this really is doable. It's a matter of international uh, cooperation at a time when multilateralism is not in the best shape it's ever been. But it's also, as has been said, the involvement of all of the stakeholders involved, uh, be it uh, governments, employers, workers, uh, civil society. SMEs, I'm not so sure that they don't want to be a part of all of this. I think because of their limited resources, the scale upon which they operate, they sometimes find it difficult or don't understand very well how they can exercise due diligence in business and human rights, play their role. And there I think it's a question of the, amongst other things, of the big helping the small. There are very important supply chain and other links between small businesses and bigger businesses. There is a mentoring, there is an assistance uh, role here that I think we have to make the fullest use of. This idea of this alliance between big, small, and medium-sized uh, business keeps coming through. Madame Bachelet, let me come to you. How do we do more? How do we accelerate the adoption of the 10 principles within business? Well, um, I think we need to continue working strongly as a global compact to show that this is not only the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do, that it will have a lot of benefits for companies. And I mentioned some of them on the long term, on investment, and so, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and we have to be able also to communicate better uh, good practices uh, that are that you can find. And so it, it shows that it can be done and it can be uh, mutually uh, beneficial for all stakeholders. I think that's the way we need to do it, to continue working strongly uh, as a UN Global Compact and to continue supporting the values and, and the principles to the global business community in terms of also to support better the SDGs, to support better climate action. But also I will add and, and to stimulate, I would say, support a, a transition to a new form and not continue to do business as usual. But I, I think the, the, the best way to do it is to show good practices and how that has benefited uh, the companies. I, I think it's very important to introduce more women in decision making uh, at, at the boards and in many other places to have a more uh, diverse representative. And I also think we should uh, link to your first question, and because of this uh, of this situation of racism and this uh, racial discrimination, uh, we are not only talking about the world, but we're also the U. The Secretary General asked, asked us as agencies to look inside our agencies if we have racial discrimination and how we finish with that. And I think companies also should do that to be able to ensure that they have all the talent and capacity uh, of all the diverse people. Like Inga said, for me as well, diversity is a wealth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. A beautiful introspection there as well. Let me come to you, Inga. In, in 30 seconds, what's one thing that we could do that could accelerate the adoption of the principles? Well, I think I mentioned it before, so I'm not going to go over it. It's the individual responsibility. It's government regulatory setting and it's setting the model. Business is leaning in and setting the model. And as Guy said, uh, alliances between big and small. Um, and it's public information, free media, and the choices we make. If we do all of this, and I think people are ready for it, people are wanting it. If we do all of this, we will actually land where we need to go, go. And we need to take all the lessons from COVID and make that positive shift, flick that green switch, because that's the only way forward on that green path that we know we have to get on. And thank you to you for your beautiful moderating. Thank you. I love the equation. Individual action, government regulation, business models and choice equals um, recovering better together and stronger. Madam Wali, I've got less than 20 seconds. What's the one thing that we could do to adopt, uh, uh, to adopt the principles more broadly and to scale? I think more than 90% of the surveyed companies have policies in place reflecting the principles. 
but only 18% are currently assessing the impact of those principles. So I think the Global Compact on its 20th anniversary should promote more assessment of the impact of the application of the in, uh, principles on the business. So the businesses realize the impact of adopting those uh, principles. Also, only 17% of the companies with a relationship to value chain and to other companies ask the extended partners to apply the principles. So promoting the idea that a company should adopt the global compact principles, but also should ask its partners and the components of its value chain to adopt the principles. Lastly, and I'm glad that Michelle Bachelet uh, did not let us end without mentioning women. I think this uh, COVID crisis has made us realize uh, the role of women, where 70% of the frontline service providers, the nurses out there helping people are women, women who are juggling uh, many, many, many roles. So I think more in inclusive work environment that has a larger diversity where women are empowered and where innovation, innovation is something that we need to really invest in and encourage because Thank you, Madam. We have officially run out of time. I do apologize. Uh, I do apologize for cutting you there. But the point is well made. Innovation and diversity. To my panelists, um, a big uh, thank you from myself here in South Africa. Thank you for your voices, your contributions, and thank you for your energy. And we're going to hand back now to our key moderator at the UN Global Compact. For myself, Nozi Poshabalala Ngiabonga. Thank you so much, Nazifo, for leading that important discussion on our 10 principles. And of course, to our four guardians for the vital role they and their colleagues play in supporting the mission of the UN Global Compact. 